Hello everybody, I'm Rene Ramos, director of the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives, and this is Rewind, the show that looks back on Florida's past with historic film and video. It's time for another trip back into the past, so sit back, relax, and enjoy another episode of Rewind. There's no talk of economic slowdown on Dodge Island. The Port of Miami is strictly a growth industry. Growth takes another form in Coral Gables, as a familiar eyesore is soon to be torn down and replaced. And how to keep your income tax from growing out of control. This is Montage. Hello, I'm Joe Abril. Some of you may remember when in the early 60s, Channel 4 was the first to focus on the need for a new deep water port for Miami. That series called Port of No Return pointed to the outdated conditions of the original port, which stood as an outcast beside a growing Miami. Port of No Return helped pave the way for efforts to create a port which would be in step with the economic and tourist boom of that decade. Last year, bad press, high crime, and a tight dollar clouded tourism prospects for South Florida, but one silver lining seemed to be the port. There was a 12% passenger increase last year, and projections for business continue to be optimistic. Today, we look at the success story of the port, how it's weathered the hard times, and the plans it's made to handle even bigger tides ahead. This was the scene about 20 years ago when a cramped and shallow port of Miami operated just a few blocks from downtown Miami. That small port was outdated even then, keeping South Florida from the profits to be made from its natural seacoast location. Miami was also noticeably out of step with other ports that dotted the U.S. coasts. The ports of New Orleans, Houston, and Long Beach were booming, bringing new blood and new capital into their cities. Well, finally, 1960, date officials got the message and planning for the new port of Miami got underway. The new port was a product of the sea, dredged up from 300 acres of dirt off Biscayne Bay. The original channel was 30 feet deep when the first ship was greeted there in 1964, and by 1968, the first passenger terminal at the port opened to the public. And that was the beginning of what has proved to be a winning combination, the Port of Miami and the cruise industry. Miami is the cruise capital of the world. There's more passengers that cruise out of Miami than any other port in the world. Uh, virtually all the growth in the cruise industry in the last six years has been accountable by the expansion of the Port of Miami. Miami is clearly the number one port in the world for passenger ships. Uh, there is nothing in the world that can touch it. About half the world's passengers sail from the Port of Miami every year. Uh, it just can't compare to the relatively minor operations of New York or Los Angeles. More and more cruise lines began looking to Miami as an attractive home port. 29 ships dock here for the winter, including 18 that remain year-round. 1,000 passengers travel on each ship every week, and servicing those ships seems to have created a whole new line of work for many South Floridians. We estimate about a billion dollars uh, that uh, is being contributed into our economy uh, by virtue of the number of services that are necessary, uh, provisions for the uh, ships, uh, the goods they buy in town, the number of jobs that are created in providing those services, as well as the uh, additional uh, banking uh, facilities that are needed. The uh, port derives its revenue from dockage fees and wharfage fees. And through that, all in toll, uh, we're looking at roughly a billion dollar industry uh, operating in our community. While all our provisioning is done here in Miami, we uh, take on all the groceries, we have the stevedores here, basically like riding, running three major resort hotels from here. Everything, our lifeline is tied to Miami. Many of these 30,000 weekly passengers are finding out that Miami is a good place to visit just for a few days, either before or after their cruise. It's a vacation that's becoming affordable to a greater number of people, and a concept that's promoted heavily by tourism officials and travel agents. Cruise lines, Miami hotels, and major airlines have joined forces, making the air-sea combination a hard-to-resist value. We have gotten in very closely now with the cruise lines because they're one of our biggest assets, uh, not only as an attraction, but also many of the cruise lines uh, bring passengers in the night before they, or even two nights before they, they leave on their cruise. And we have the gift of having those passengers exposed to our community at that point in the game. 
Miami has a lot to offer to them. There is terrific sightseeing. The shopping is super. They can do that before and after the cruise, too. Um, restaurants, you've got some of the greatest restaurants, I think. And uh, escaping the Chicago weather and enjoying the Miami weather is, of course, one big attraction. Expanding the port to accommodate the cruise industry is only half the story. While the port worked to attract the passenger travel market, it also expanded its cargo operations. Miami is the closest of all U.S. ports to the lucrative markets of the Caribbean Basin and Central and South America. And it's this area of the world that's receiving increasing amounts of electronics, household goods, and food. There's weekly, even daily service to these destinations. And the faster the trip, say shippers, the bigger the profits and the sooner they can be spent. The cargo is, uh, operations here at the port is just as exciting as the uh, cruise industry. Some 78% of our 3 million tons was export. Uh, our commodities were worth some $8 billion. We literally stocked the grocery stores uh, in the uh, Caribbean and Latin American uh, markets. Uh, secondly, we are uh, the shortest distance of any port to uh, these countries, and of course that means that the uh, the steamship lines do not have to use or burn as much oil in running to these ports. Our turnaround time is much faster and that is a definite benefit to the exporter. The international flavor of the downtown business district can also be traced back to operations at the port. A fleet of banking, real estate and government positions have been filled by Floridians. It's estimated that eight to 10,000 local employees are on a payroll for some activity connected either directly or indirectly with the Port of Miami. How this translates into dollars for Miami is explained by one cruise company. Well, take 1982 as an example. We'll generate about $200 million a year. And of that, about 30% or $60 million uh, will be generated in Dade County. Uh, either through the airlines, through travel agents, through our own operation, the ship channeling, provisioning of the ships, and so on and so forth, our office staff. Ford appears to have learned some hard lessons from having once fallen behind Miami's progress. Growing pains are over and there are solid plans for future growth. Now in phase two of a four-part expansion plan, space and services at the port will be doubled by 1990. A quarter billion dollars will be spent to create a new channel and dredge out yet another island. A five-story administration center is scheduled to open this spring. But the addition everyone is most anxious to see completed is a wider bridge for the port, perhaps a symbolic reminder of America's most ambitious port. With all the good news about Miami's port, there has been some bad as well. 22 shipping executives and union officials have been indicted on a variety of charges ranging from extortion and tax evasion to obstruction of justice. The cases involved alleged nationwide conspiracies to control key seaports along the southeast coast through racketeering activities. Through the undercover work of one local shipping official, Joey Teitelbaum, many of the prosecutions have been successful. Eight of the 22 pleaded guilty before the cases went to trial in January of 1979. That September, a federal jury here convicted 10 more on a variety of charges. Some of the cases are on appeal, and federal strike force officials are still keeping an eye on the port for illegal activity. Miami-Dade College has career paths in anything you want to be. What's your story? Be global. Be cutting edge. Be inventive. Be investigative. Be a hero. What do you want to be? Be the best. Be you. Be MDC. Well, we are all being inundated by um, 
tax tips, how to prepare our returns for 81, et cetera, et cetera. You may be sick and tired of it, but until April 15th comes uh, and goes, we're going to have to deal with it. Now, according to the author, this is the best-selling book around today on, on this subject. Uh, it's an enticing title, I must say. But uh, CPA Barry Steiner from Chicago says it's, uh, Barry, I'm, I'm sure you'll stipulate to this what you told me. This is the best-selling one on the market. That's correct. What's the most important thing you want to get across to people other than to buy your book, but other than that, uh, about filling out those returns? Well, number one, I don't care if people buy my book. My primary concern, believe it or not, is that people save money on their taxes. I think far too many people are intimidated into filing this short form. That means not even trying to itemize, not even paying attention to some of these little income tax tips. If you file the short form last year, that doesn't mean that you automatically file it again this year. You should make an attempt to try to itemize, which means listing medical expenses, contributions, job hunting expenses, interest, real estate taxes, any losses during the year. Try to list all those things, and if you can wind up beating the standard deduction, which for a single person is $2,300, or if you're married, $3,400, try to go ahead and itemize. It'll wind up saving you money in the long run. How about uh, uh, the idea that most people are honest in America and, and truly report all that they have to, while in reality only about 1%, maybe 2% of the returns are ever audited? Uh, you were telling me when, before we started that's not true. Most Americans aren't, don't report everything. We've been led a company line by the U.S. government that we happen to be totally honest, that the American taxpayer is the most honest tax, pay, tax filing citizen in the entire world. And we laugh at countries, uh, Italy and Spain, where the national pastime is fool the tax man. Yet whenever they run statistical surveys and they use computers in order to match these 1099 forms that we receive from banks and savings and loans and on stock, and they found that a surprisingly high percentage of Americans don't report all their interest in dividends. That's only the tip of the iceberg. I'm sure we've all come in contact or, or know for, firsthand people who work over at swap shops. They don't report all their income. Yeah. Tradespeople who come to you, they say, look, if you give me a check, I have to pick it up on my income tax return. It'll wind up costing you $100, but if you're paying cash, it's only 50 What do you think of the IRS as a, an American institution? It's not a bad place to work, but I wouldn't want to live there. And you have worked there, right? I had worked for Internal Revenue Service. They're doing a very difficult job in this day and age. They're bureaucrats. They're hardworking accountants trying to do uh, what will never be a popular job. They're trying to take our money. Okay? The, I remember when I had worked for Internal Revenue Service, no one bothered telling me that when you go to a party and someone asks what you do for a living, when you mention that you work for Internal Revenue Service, no one will come and talk to you afterwards. <laughs> they don't even come up and ask you income tax questions. They just they refuse to associate with you. Is that true? That is true. You live a very lonely life. Yeah. No. They're a needed profession. They, uh, they earn something like $26 for every dollar that's spent on the IRS budget, yet they're cutting back on IRS dollars in order to operate it. So that's kind of a two-edged sword. Have uh, Reaganomics really made a tremendous tax savings impact on the average American that we're led to believe it has? The tax effect that we saw for this past year, there was a 1.25% income tax cut. It came out to be for a family earning $25,000 a year, maybe something like $3 a week. But that's more than counterbalanced by the increased Social Security tax that we have to pay now. When all said and done, we're behind the eight ball and we have to play catch up. That's why it's so important, Joe, to understand all these little known income tax tips in order to wind up saving some money now. Yeah, I know there's always kind of the implication that somebody like you who's, who has a pay less tax legally is still kind of doing something not really ethical or right. And really all you're doing is say, here's the law, get your maximum advantage from the law. That's now, all. Why, but a lot of people say, well, that's, gee, I feel bad doing that. Well, it's called pay less tax legally, not illegally. I probably right. could have sold a million more books had I done <laughs> it that way. The name of the game is income tax advice. The reason why I'm here as opposed to another CPA is maybe we contacted you sooner. But I have no further or better income tax advice than going to a good accountant, getting the best advice you possibly can. 
And when we start talking about this whole question of advice, it becomes a matter of who do you turn to? If you have an income tax question, you can call Internal Revenue Service. They'll answer your income tax questions free of charge. But they won't volunteer anything. Well, they won't volunteer anything. And for the first time since 1954, they'll no longer do your income tax return. Hmm. They used to be able to do it. They won't do it anymore. You can go to a professional. You can go to a CPA, someone who's a professional accountant, someone who is called an enrolled agent. This is someone who has passed a very difficult examination put out by Internal Revenue Service twice a year. Someone who's an enrolled agent, he knows his stuff. You can go to an attorney. He may or may not know income tax. The one thing you, you can count on, he's going to know how to charge you. <laughs> the attorney's song is, the best things in life are fees, mm. you know? <laughs> but, but listen, Barry, not all CPAs are good tax return preparers either. Many of them don't even get involved in income That's tax right. preparation. Uh, me, most CPAs earn their bread and butter by auditing companies, uh, doing certified audits. and. When someone comes in off the street to have their income tax return done, they're regarded as a pain in the derriere, you know? Mm. Uh, and what accountants will do is they'll try to turn them off completely, this off-the-street business, quote-unquote, by charging ridiculous minimum fees of $250, $300. When we start talking about these commercial income tax services, I have nothing good to say about them. They take people off the street to work for them who have no aptitude for accounting, no ability, no desire to save people money. That's got to be the most important thing, a desire to help people save their hard-earned tax dollars. Yet they run ads, earn a year's income in three months, yeah. make big money doing income tax returns. And these type of commercial tax services will rip you off. An average person who's going to someone like that uh, would probably do far better if they did their own income tax return or if they simply took the advice from their brother-in-law. The only purpose that these people f serve is, number one, they have the forms that you can get by yourself by going to the nearest uh, Internal Revenue Service office, your nearest bank or savings loan, picking up the forms, and they know what line to put the numbers on. That's all. But they appeal to a very basic fear because my palms start to sweat when I think that I might have to fill out my long tax form. Uh, thank heavens I don't. but. I meant to ask you, do most people still file their own income tax returns? Right now it's about 50-50. Really? 50% 50 of the people will make it through on their own. 50% of the people go to either professional accountants, they go to the commercial tax services, they get advice from their brother-in-law. The number of retirees down here in South Florida where they'll use the AARP service where retired accountants will come in and do their tax return free of charge. And that happens to be a good way of saving some money. Very out of town. Let's show them this again. Pay tax less. Pay less tax legally. Uh, it, it, it's fairly easy to understand. It's three ninety-five, but you can go in a newsstand maybe and stand around and read it free for a while and pick up some information. Barry Steiner, thanks very much. You figure your own returns, I presume. I have a good accountant. You have a good accountant. Okay. <laughs> thanks for being with us. We'll be right back. Miami-Dade College has career paths in anything you want to be. What's your story? Be global. Be cutting edge. Be inventive. Be investigative. Be a hero. What do you want to be? Be the best. Be you. Be MDC. One of Dade's biggest problems is housing, and you run right smack into it on the fringes of one of the county's most affluent cities. Diana gonzalez Duruthi reports that some solutions to the problem are on the way. The rundown shacks and dilapidated concrete monsters are a familiar eyesore for people who drive by this out-of-place Coral Gables neighborhood right off US-1. The view from inside is even more disconcerting. This is someone's home. The tenant pays $150 a month for this place, even though she stays with her mother in a nearby apartment most of the time, because her bathroom hasn't worked for months. Since last year in October, and um, they took some pieces out, but they never did come back to fix it. And that been like that, it backs up and all on the floor. It backs up in the tub, in the sink. 
and the light switch up here is broke. The tenant asked us not to film her, and she did not give us her name for fear she might lose her apartment. These are the living conditions that exist for the residents in this blighted area. It is overcrowded and run down, not to mention the fact that the buildings stand practically on top of the county's busiest street. But if all goes as planned, within a few years this will be an entirely new housing community. The major goal is to create a more viable environment and to upgrade the housing for primarily low and moderate income persons within the Coral Gables redevelopment area. The work has already started. Most of the old wooden shacks and some of the apartment buildings are boarded up and have been bought by Little HUD, Dade's Department of Housing and Urban Development. Some have already been demolished and the lots cleared. HUD must still bargain for a selling price with the landlords of some of the other buildings. What housing facilities will take the place of these apartments? That has caused some controversy from the beginning. Originally, the plan called for replacing 117 existing units with 10 new privately owned homes and 10 new single-family rental homes. But some tenants in the area filed a suit claiming the redevelopment project would not meet the housing requirements of this neighborhood. Where would all the residents go? We didn't want to create or recreate the same conditions that now exist. And that's something that we have to be very, very careful about because you can say, well, all right, you're re taking away 117 units, put 117 units back. But within the law and in terms of um, the open space that would be required, okay, put them on top of each other. You just, you can't do that. That's just not logical either. So we were able to, through discussions with legal services as well as in reviewing different solutions with the community again, came up with a, for lack of a better term, a compromise solution. This is the model of the new proposal. Instead of 10 rental homes, the plan calls for 34 townhouse units. But since this neighborhood is inside Coral Gables, city officials must okay the proposal. Admittedly, they prefer the original plan, despite the apparent need for more housing. The idea of redevelopment in the Grove was to uh, sort of erase the uh, obvious uh, line between uh, the total Coral Gables area and uh, that segment uh, in Coconut Grove. The ones that were proposed originally was the single family concept, the same as we have in the Golden Gate area. And that was brought about by public hearings and meetings uh, with the citizens and uh, of the area. And uh, the city had uh, abided by their uh, original request to have uh, more single family residents in keeping with the overall concepts of the city of Coral Gables. Issues still have to be resolved. Even if that happens quickly, it will still be at least two years before the county begins construction in this area. But just down the street is a successful example of neighborhood redevelopment. Lola Walker has lived in this community called Golden Gate since 1939 in one of the neighborhood's original wood homes. It is surrounded by newly constructed houses and some that have been restored. Mrs. Walker is a member of the Coral Gables Citizens Advisory Committee. She claims most of the residents want the area off US-1 to be developed just like Golden Gate, without multifamily rental housing. The majority of the people want to own their own homes. Uh, I don't get, I get a very, very few uh, requests from people that would like to go on renting. If they go on renting, they want a better place to live. But the majority of the people would like to buy their own homes, and they're looking forward to having it redeveloped. But along with redevelopment comes relocation. Uh, when you have projects of this nature, where do you relocate people? You don't really want to lo relocate them out of their neighborhood, the neighborhood that they've been accustomed to. Many of them have lived here for a very long time. Luckily, with the timing of the other projects in the target area, those resources have been available to relocate the person. Samuel Prophet was one of the lucky ones. A grocery store once stood on this cleared lot. Prophet and his family lived above the store in a $60 a month apartment. Now he owns this $41,000 home in a newly redeveloped area. He was given $4,000 by HUD for relocation since he would obviously be forced to move and pay more than $60 a month. He used the money for a down payment and now he and his family have a new three bedroom home. The objective of the Coral Gables redevelopment program is to improve the living conditions of all the residents in this area. No one is sure how it ever got this bad, this crowded. It will take a lot of time and millions of dollars to correct the mistake.
a landscaped area that would put more space in between the proposed new homes and the highway is also planned. But federal budget cuts have put a hold on this and other area improvements. The county is hoping the city of Coral Gables will pick up the tab so the project can be completed as planned. Are you prepared for a disaster? Most of us don't give a lot of thought to the possibility of another Great Depression or the ultimate disaster, nuclear war. But there are some among us who are actively trying to prepare for these things. Next week on Montage, we'll look at these survivalists and see what they're doing to make sure they'll still be around no matter what happens. We'll also show you Metro Police trying a new anti-crime program. And I'll talk with the mother of the feminist movement, Betty Friedan. That's our montage for this week. I'm Joe Abril. That's about it for this edition of Rewind. Just time to remind you that Rewind features historical film and video from the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives. To see more from the Wolfson Archives collections, visit our website, wolfsonarchives.org. You can search the archives catalog and watch video online. And be sure to connect to our YouTube channel where you will find hundreds of carefully curated clips or link to the Wolfson Archives Facebook page to keep up with our busy calendar of historical happenings. Until next time, I'm Rene Ramos. Thanks for watching. Oh, wow.